Today on a couple of pointers podcast, we're lucky enough to have Guillermo Blanco from Reach. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Ricky. Did I get that right? I believe most people just call you G. Yeah, it's we were discussing before this call, but it's a pretty hard to pronounce name, but usually people call me G. It's way easier. All right, so you can be our email G or Guillermo, not gangster. Now tell me, for the sake of the audience, explain it like I'm five. What do you do? Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Reach, and what we're doing at Reach, we're, we have this tool that makes email personalization faster. So usually an email, it takes around five minutes to personalize every single email. We're just driving that number down to 30 seconds. So we're making reps more effective. Now, besides just the time saving, I imagine there's also other benefits to to your form of personalization. Yeah, I mean, we usually have a couple of users, right? Like it's either the user that doesn't personalize because it takes a lot of time, or there's also, on the other hand, the user that personalizes. So for the first user, the one that doesn't personalize, personalization helps them getting more reply rates, more email del deliverability and more open rates. For the second one, it's more of making them more effective. So they're already personalizing their emails. So if we can help them make that faster and probably send like 20, 30, 40 email, more emails a day and get roughly the same result, well, we're making you more effective. So in that sense, we're helping you save time. I love it. Now, typically, what have you found? Is it like VPs of sales and sales leaders that are trying to onboard your program so that they can standardize personalization across their apps? Or do you actually find more end users trying to download their program, your program so that they can do their job better? That's a great question. I would say usually reps are the ones that are signing up because think about it. You're, for example, you're a rep and you get to get 20 meetings a week. You know, you're the first interested one to get more replies, to start more conversations. So I've seen a bunch of reps signing up to reach because they're like, all right, I want to give this a try. I need to hit quota, right? On the other hand, when it's more of a, how do you call it? More of a company strategy thing. It's usually the SDR manager, director of business development, or even VP of sales in some cases that have come to us saying like, all right, reply rates are very low. One of the things that we've noticed is that we've accepted a 0.5 or 1% reply rate, and that shouldn't be the case. Of course, it's gonna change depending on industries, right? Like if you're selling enterprise, you're gonna get a lower reply rate, but we've accepted the fact that's normal and it is not, right? So usually VP of sales are the first ones to understand that shouldn't be the case, right? Reply rates are going down, but they're secure to it and they come to us hoping to get more replies. I love that the problem you're solving is around that research piece because we obviously manage a lot of reps and we encourage personalization of emails and we'll get into relevancy in a minute. But whenever we're trying to analyze how they're spending their time so that we can look to help them maximize their efficiency, one of the black holes is research. Yeah. You know, people talk about the five by five or the three by three, you know, spend three minutes finding three relevant pieces of personalization. But that's just never the case. It always takes the three by three is actually that it takes three times longer than everyone says it should. Yep, that's the case, that's it. Yep. What are some of the pieces that you can personalize on? So usually the way we see personalization is composed of a couple of things. The first one is research. And that's usually the most, the thing that takes the longest, right? Because you usually, for every single one of your leads, you're gonna have to open a bunch of sources or data sources, that's how we call it on reach, but I'm referring to LinkedIn, company LinkedIn, mm -hmm. company website, company news, company blogs, podcasts, financial papers. There's so much information out there that just by opening and researching on those aspects, it takes a lot of time. One of the things we're doing yeah. in order to make this faster is we're aggregating all that information. So rather than having to jump in between tabs, you're going to have all that information under the same screen, right? The other thing, again, is once you have all that information, all that research, which again, is what takes the most amount of time, you're going to look for what's more relevant to what you're selling. 
And that's one of the things, one of the features that we're the most interested in and that we're going to be probably launching next month is that make research faster. All right. Out of all these data sources, just show me what's more relevant to what I'm selling. Just throw, show me three snippets that I can use for my emails. Now mm -hmm. that's cool when you're doing it for just one person, but imagine it doing it for a hundred people. That's when the time yeah. saving comes in. Or, or a thousand, right? We know what SDRs are doing. So I, that's really interesting to me. So I get a lot of personalized emails. Hey, Ricky, we can see that you're the treasurer of the N charity. By the way, have you seen our tech stack around HR compliance? And you're like, come on, that's not personalization, right? That's I, It's obvious that it's a data scrape. So yeah. do you, by putting all of that information in front of the rep, and just saving that, them that time and collating the research, that in itself is a tremendous benefit because even if they don't use automation to then insert that into an email, they've already just saved time by having that all on a page. Exactly. Wow. Okay, that's very interesting because I've always shied away from these tools thinking, come on, no one's ever going to do it as well as a human who's applying their intellect and their logic. But if really you just one of the things you're doing is bringing all of that research into a single place where they can save five minutes just from opening up all the various data sources. That is interesting because that removes all of my fear of poor personalization. There's this fear or there's these people don't like automation, right? We're all always striving for automation in sales, but sales is human. So you're going to be somehow limited by how much automation you're using. The way we see it at Rich is that personalization, emails, all these things will never be fully automated. Otherwise, why would we have SDRs? Why would we have account executives in the first place, right? Sure, well, but the difference between automation and efficiency, right? Sure. Mom, I've got a hot water system that's always boiling. I walk up and hot water comes out of it. You know, it's not automated, but it's efficient that it's exactly there when I need it. And I save 20 minutes a day waiting for the kettle to boil. Exactly. And that's what we are, that's our vision with, with Rich. What we want to do is we want to make reps more efficient. We don't want them to, don't want to hand them the personalization. Again, what Rich does is aggregating all that information. We're making reps more efficient, but then we're also suggesting a couple of icebreakers that get you started. You don't have to type the whole thing by yourself, but most likely you're going to be editing to resemble your style. So just by saving you time on research and saving you time on copy, we're not anyhow automating the whole process, but we're going to make you more efficient while getting more replies. Hopefully. Now, let's just say that they tend to found that the one personalization on average, they were quite happy to automate. Is that something that's possible within the platform? I mean, ideally, one of the things that we'll want to do in the future is the amount of tweaks that you get to make is that it's as small as possible. But I don't think we'll ever, when it comes to AI, I don't think we'll ever come to automate the whole process. Think about it, you know, like AI, we're getting new models every day. They're like getting more sophisticated and all these things. But at the end of the day, it's a human, as you were saying before, that needs to review what's going on, right? Like I wouldn't trust AI to just click a button and send the emails for me. I would never trust it because AI has mistakes. So there's always got to be a human reviewing and editing and tweaking all the things that an AI is going to make. In the future, those tweaks will be minimal. But for now, there's always got to be someone that's going to review all the outputs from an AI. Yeah, you know, I actually prefer that, to be honest. I've always shied away from these things thinking it's going to be crap. But if, if what you're doing is putting it in front of me, allowing those tweaks and just giving me those suggestions, then I really like that. Now, onto some of the personalizations before we get to relevancy. What are some of the very interesting ways that people are using personalization at the moment? For example, I've heard of someone mentioning the mayor of the town that they're in or the number one restaurant on Yelp. What are some of the, yeah. the things that are working right now? So when it comes to personalization, we see there's four types of personalization. The level one, the lowest kind of personalization, that's going to be variable based personalization. And that's what we are all using in sales. That's high first name so that you work at company, right? Like we have these variables that get swapped in automatically. That's the lowest yeah. level of personalization. Then the second one can be things that are funny. Such if you, we went to the same college, I might be like, hey, you know, like we went to the same college. It's not 
something that it's very relevant and it's usually that personalization that it's either like all right based on your city based on the college you went to based on that if you've been doing like whatever right but it's not that sort of relevant the third one it's going to be the one that it's either related to company website, LinkedIn, all these data sources that we were discussing before. But then on the fourth one is where the magic happens. And it's the same data sources that we were using on the third type of personalization, but now we're making it relevant. So it's, for example, if I'm reaching out to someone in sales, I can grab something relevant from LinkedIn, whatever. But if it's something that it's specific to what I'm selling or something that it's relevant to what I'm selling, that's level four personalization. That's where the magic in the email flows, right? Like it's, you're grabbing yeah. something that it's relevant, something that it's related to what you're selling and you're putting it into an email that flows. That's a 10 out of 10 email. Yeah. I mean, it also ideally needs to hit that trigger. I've seen some really clever growth hacking as I'd call it, because I don't think it's scalable to an enterprise level, but it is certainly at a small level where people will do something like prospect to everyone in the city of Liverpool and they will prospect on a Monday and they will use the score from the Liverpool game saying something along the lines of, hey, I'm sure you're feeling pretty beat over the weekend. Three love is a, you know, three nil is a pretty rough score, but here's something to make you feel better. So it's like, yeah. got good timing. It's kind of personalized. They've made it a little bit, you know, human and funny, but it's still not relevant because they'll then jump into whatever it is that they're selling, like some kind of marketing technology. Exactly. We call it how do you capture that relevancy so relevance it's actually tough to capture because there's not that much information out there so first of all when we talk about relevance starts at the icp icp meaning ideal customer profile so for example if i'm reaching out if i'm selling email personalization if i'm reaching out to someone that it his job is sales i'm relevant Right, the, the relevance comes from the ICP first, right? Because if I'm reaching out to someone in sales and I'm selling HR solutions, that's not relevant. That doesn't have anything to do with their daily lives, right? Like, so first of yeah. all, relevance starts on the ICP. If you got the right ICP, most of the times you're gonna be relevant. Then again, the second part of the relevance comes from personalization. And we were discussing it before. If I'm saying like, hey, Ricky, I saw your post about, I don't know, you know, like, how cool is the spring? These are my po -po 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 -po. and I'm selling you email personalization. That personalization, it's not relevant. The rest of the email is yeah. that you just created that tension in which what does have to do with what I'm, you know, with what you're selling, so if that's it, right? So. For us, relevance. I like that idea there. Yeah, I like that yeah. idea that bad personalization actually decreases the relevancy of the email. Yeah, it's, it, it comes out like as, because what you're doing with that, if you're just like naming things or like, oh, you, I just saw that you, whatever, you know, like, and it's, you're making the email not flow. And that usually pisses people off. It's like, what does have to do with, you know, what you're selling? It doesn't, it's not telling me anything. That's why, like, we see relevance coming in two places. It's either like you're reaching out to the right ICP, which if you're doing sales, you should, right? Otherwise, you're just shooting in the air. And the second one is like out of the personalization that you're going to add, since you want to get more replies, make it relevant. Now, you might not always find information out there to make your personalization relevant, but there's some creative way to do it, right? So for example, we were talking about the Liverpool stuff. Imagine you went on to a ski trip. That's sort of a trigger, right? Because you maybe go twice a year, then I can use that in personalization. And the way this would work, it would be like, hey, Ricky, so you were at whatever mountain skin, email personalization can be a steep slope, right? We're tying the non-relevant personalization to whatever I'm trying to sell you. Email personalization can be like going up a steep slope, just like in skin, blah, blah, blah. And then I get to the value proposition. So if you're creative yeah. with personalization, even if you're not being relevant, you can make it work and stand out from the crowd because creativity is something that AI sti is still learning how to do. Yeah, so in that example, reach your tool 
would give you the personalization they're suggesting that this person went skiing and then it would be on the sales rep the sdr or the bdr to tie that to the relevancy saying sale you know personalization can be a steep slope reaches the ski lift to get you to the top of that mountain exactly exactly so right now that's how it goes but in the near future what we'll do is out of all the information we could gather from one person i'm just gonna show you the three snippets that are the most relevant to what you're selling mm -hmm. so for example if you're selling a tool for salespeople, you only care information that relates to sales if they manage an sdr team if they hit quota three months in a row, if they are crushing it because they're growing and their sales are going up. That's relevant information that you care about when you're trying to personalize your email for salespeople. Now, the relevance changes when you're reaching out to an HR person, right? And then it's, all right, you're hiring. You're like, your team is growing. Maybe you have high rotation. People are bouncing from the company. Those are relevant yeah. things for HR. In the near future, reach, depending on what sector, do you sell too? We'll give you all that information that it's more relevant to your tool or to what you're selling. You know, that's something that someone like Jordan Crawford talks about all the time. Personalization and relevance, that's about pain. And when you do get that right, you can do it at scale. So for example, if a company is struggling to fill a position and they're, they're the talent acquisition and they've had jobs on the market for six months or for four months or whatever it is, you can use that as a pain point. You don't need to know more. And you can scrape that data and say, hey, we've seen that you've had this job open for X months. You know, and then you can tie that to the relevance of your outreach. But I really love those opportunities where you can do things at scale, but it has to be hyper relevant. The personalization absolutely does help increase open rates. Mm. Have you seen any case studies from customers coming to you? So they were doing essentially the same value proposition, you know, the same pain statements, the same email in general, but now that they've added your personalization, have seen an uplift or a decrease yeah. in opens? Yeah, these, we don't have an exact data because personalization is just a subset of cold emails. So for example, usually, mm -hmm or generally, we definitely see more opens, especially if you're leading with a personalization right on top, that picks interest, right? That another thing that email personalization helps with is email deliverability. Right now, reps are yep. sending 200, 300, 400 emails a day, and those emails are all very similar to each other. So if yep. you start changing the way every email is, and every email is more unique, email deliverability is better because that's Google not picking up like, all right, this guy is just spamming out people. Every email is more yeah. different to each other. So I'm going to let them through, right? And on the other hand- uh, 100%. Yeah. And, and on the other hand is reply rate. Ultimately, our goal is going to be that, right? So if- That's all that matters is reply. Exactly. But if, if it happened to you, I bet, Ricky, but you get an email and we as salespeople are very fast to see if that was a template. And that's a huge turn off. I think everyone is, maybe over the last two, three years, this high volume outbound approach has just become so prevalent that everyone is used to seeing that same thing. And so maybe they went from long emails to really short, succinct 50 word emails. And then that worked for a little while. And now everyone's attuned to that as well. Yeah, I mean- It's it, just it, becoming it, harder and harder. Yeah, this all comes to tools, you know? Before, 10 years ago, there weren't sequencing tools. So just by yeah. following up manually, that you had a huge success, right? Now, sales yeah. and outreach come into place. What this does is the new baseline is lifted. So everyone now can follow up. Well, you gotta do something different, right? You gotta personalize. Well, personalization takes a lot of time. And therefore, not a lot of people are doing it. You're standing out from the crowd and therefore you're getting yeah. more replies. Now we're getting into this new wave in which tools like Breach are going to create a new baseline. The same way that we don't imagine a sequence without follow-ups, there will be a future in one year, two years that we won't see any email that it's not personalized and relevantly personalized to every person that we're reaching out to. So this is a matter of tools, you know, new tools come in. Therefore, the baseline gets lifted and people expect more from yeah. outreach.
That's why yep. sending and 100, 200, 300 emails doesn't make you unique anymore because there's a hundred reps doing that every single day. So you get to stand up from the crowd, be a little bit different. And therefore, that's how you're going to get replies. And I'll tell you the simplest test that we've done, which in my mind proves that personalization really works. On our bump emails, we've had two different templates or the breakup email, whichever one it is, the one where it says, you know, this might not be for you. Is there someone else that we should be speaking to? It's a very common email. Everyone would have received a thousand of them yeah. by now. We changed it up just in one little way. We said, hey, G, you might not be the right person to speak to. Would, and then we insert the one person above them in the chain, in their hierarchy's name. Yeah. You know, would Nick be a better person to speak to? And just by adding in that person's name, we had a threefold increase in replies. Yeah. I didn't have to do anything else. Just go to their LinkedIn, you know, look at the hierarchy and go, okay, well, this guy's the VP of sales. Who's the CRO? Well, this guy's the director. Who's the VP? Whatever it is. And just find a name, stick it in there. Three times increase in replies. And the thing, and we usually use this as well, you know, because it's one of the best ways to stand up from the crowd. This also correlates with the way that in, if you add personalization along the line of your cadence, the more to the end of the cadence that you are, if you add personalization there, it gets many more replies. So personalization in the first email, it boosts replies, right? There's no doubt about that. Yeah. If you add personalization on the second email, two times that. If you add personalization to the third email, three times that. And I'm not even talking about variable personalization, right? Like company name. You're talking about relevance, hyper-personalized. Things that could only be found out if you spend the time to do the research. If you start adding those uh, across the line, the reply rates skyrocket. And that's what you're seeing, right? Like just putting the name of a manager or a VP of sales at the last email, many more replies. Yeah, of course, because I think oh, I don't want this going through to my boss and them saying, hey, I really try to get hold of G, but he was non-responsive. And then the boss is interested. Well, I need to take that risk away and engage in this now. And it's really interesting that personalization, one of the trends that we've been seeing is this classic SDR model, this volume-based outreach is slowly getting squeezed. You've got product-led growth taking a much larger footprint as well as account-based sales and marketing. And people are looking at ways that how can they utilize their SDR skills in a more sophisticated way. Instead of prospecting to a thousand people or to 500 people a week, how can we do it to a hundred, but increase the conversion rate? And that's where personalization is really becoming a genuine art. Exactly. And this is, this goes, and, oh, sorry, Ricky, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, you know, we have reps reading the financial reviews, looking for that hyper-personalized way to crack in, using humor, doing everything that they can do to say, hey, I'm not, you weren't one of a thousand people I contacted. This is happening. This is very true. And this is happening because of what we were discussing before having new tools create new baselines so if before someone had to reach out to someone manually and have a list of 100 people that made you unique because people normally could only reach out to 20 people they couldn't go further right like so the more volume the better right now the story is shifting and right now it's moving from volume to quality but again, if you're doing sales, you're going to keep a happy balance in between both, right? Like you can not only go to quality, Absolutely. going only quality is very risky. And this goes aligned with personalization. Everyone believes personalization. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't know much Spanish, but I do know from my Taco Bill advert, Pequeno Las Dos. <laughs> Wait, well, what's the pronunciation? So, well, I think I've got to, I've, have I butchered it? Pequeno Las Dos. Pequeno Las Dos. Pequeno Las Dos. Exactly. Yeah. See, Taco Bell is right. So <laughs> that's the thing, you know, like <laughs> in going only volume, you're going to kill domain. You're going to come off yeah. spammy. You burn it. Uh, you're going to land in spam. You're not going to do anything. On the other hand, only quality. It's the riskiest sport in the world because, all right, I might hyper personalize the three touches I'm doing to five people. Now I might spend a day to do just that. If I don't get any reply, that means that I'm just doing the same amount of work that someone that is reaching out to 200 people. So where do we find this happy medium in which we are doing quality, but also trying to pick up high quantity, right? Like that's where tools like Reach can help with that because personalizing alone is very risky. 
you spend five minutes but if we can decrease the amount of time you end up spending on personalization uh, we're reducing the risk and therefore we're starting to have this happy medium when it comes to reps since we've seen that volume doesn't matter anymore reps are they're like they're adapting they're adapting fast and we're seeing now link influencers right one of the best yeah. ways to engage with prospects is by creating content and you come off as not salesy right? People are more open to you, you're providing value, and therefore the relationship with your prospects is more natural rather than just like coming off like spamming and all these things, right? Like, therefore, uh, we, we are seeing this shifting in social selling that a lot of people are discussing about on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm quite excited about one particular use case. At points where we do a lot of enterprise prospecting like really sophisticated you know companies that have a total addressable market of say a thousand companies or a hundred for some of our customers and we might land up targeting 20 people within a single account of the 25 might be part of the buying committee and the decision making committee and a lot of the rest are ancillary people that we are essentially trying to use to see if we can get a foot in the door and get an internal referral. And we can go quite wide looking for internal referrals, but it's very time consuming personalization, personalizing and making those referral campaigns hyper relevant. Essentially what we're selling is not relevant to the person we're reaching out to. It's relevant for the company, but I just need a quick little hook so that I can get an internal referral. And I think tools like this could be genuinely helpful there even if not for my primary targets which i would quite comfortably invest a single day just in trying to reach out to one in that main person you know, these are major deals but the rest of the 20 for sure if somehow you could bring up on my screen that this person's just been on a ski trip and or we did go to the same school right? or they've got a blog about you know, rating spaghetti bolognese all over the world. I'll use that and I'll get a meeting 10 times out of 10. Definitely, it, especially when it comes to ABM sort of selling, you know, like account based and you're going after more than one person because usually sales don't happen just with one person, right? Like if you're yeah. going to sell to sales people, just by convincing the VP of sales is not enough anymore. You get to convince directors, yeah. you get to convince managers, and ultimately, you're going to have to convince the people that are going to be using your tool on a daily basis, right? And these are reps. That's why ABM comes in so handy, because whenever you're going to reach out to HubSpot or whoever other company it is, you're going to go top bottom. That means you're going to be very personalized with your outreach to VP of sales, directors, managers, all these decision makers. But then again, as you were saying, you want to get the foot on the door and you want to create champions internally and that means that you also want to reach out to reps account executives and that's usually called the bottoms up right so i think that for mm -hmm. any sales approach any successful sales approach you'll want to do both the bottoms up meets meets but tops yeah bottoms exactly so <laughs> exactly <laughs> you, you get the point but it's you usually i get the point yeah you want to reach out to everyone so, who's going to be involved in this so g tell me if an sdr or a sales leader listening to this is interested to take a peek and test it and see how well it could do to personalize an email for themselves as if they were prospecting for themselves just to give it a little bit of a what do they need to do they just gotta either ping me on linkedin Guillermo Blanco. It's a little bit tough, but Ricky will leave it up to on LinkedIn. And on the other hand, you can just visit our website and sign up. We are free to use. We have a freemium model. So just go visit magicreach.ai and you'll be able to sign up there and start using Reach from this very same moment. That's that's quite impressive. Very simple. And I mean, would a normal rep be able to use it? What are the limitations? Would they be able to get 5, 10, 15, get a real good use case out of it before they could take it through to their sales leaders to say, I think we should make this a permanent part of our tech stack? Yeah, so usually you're gonna have 15 credits. So you're gonna be able to personalize 15 emails every month for free. And from there, you can just scale it. If you like it, you can scale it up to your manager and you can upsell it. Otherwise, it's very simple to use. You import all your contacts from Salesforce, HubSpot, whatever CRM you're using. 
you're going to be personalizing within reach. You're going to make the tweaks. We're not fully automated. So you want to review every icebreaker still is going to be a massive time changer. And once you're personalized every prospect, you're going to be reaching out to just export and you just sequence either using sales love outreach or any other tool that you're currently using. That's fantastic. I'll put, I like to add those icebreakers as custom fields. So we use Apollo, for example, or Outreach, and I, I sync those through to the CRM and they're always there available for me when I need to pull exactly. them out. But it's been a real pleasure chatting to you. And I love speaking to people that are hyper-focused within one particular niche within outreach, within that outbound motion, because I'm focusing across the board. I'm looking at every, dealing with CROs on the science of sale, selling and all of the data analytics, I'm dealing with CMOs in how to better incorporate you know, their sales and marketing team alignment and getting to learn the absolute specifics from people that have really specialized in one particular piece is a real treat. And if anyone listening to this wants to learn about about personalization, learn about how to take something personalized and convert it into something relevant, give G a call. Thanks so much, Ricky. It's been my pleasure. It's been fantastic having you. We'll chat again soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.